since we're telling Titans jokes. We were talking this week about some of the great victories that Sycamore's had this year, which he's la- he's had a lot to do with, which is amazing. And uh, I was just telling him, I was like, man, you guys ought to go give some clinics to the Titans. They could probably use it. Man, it's good to be with you guys. Uh, you may need to scoot in. We have people standing in the back. I'm just saying. So it's a good problem to have. So, you know, make some room. Point, point. If you got seats next to you, point. Maybe just say, hey, there's, there's seats over here. We'll, we'll take you. We'll take you in. Um, so we are, um, I'm going to go ahead and jump into this. We're in this series, uh, getting pretty close to wrapping this series up on the parables of Jesus. Uh, we're not covering all of the parables. We'll probably come back to this at some point, uh, do a volume two, if you will. I tried to get Ben to, to label this volume one, and he was like, no, he's like he, he wouldn't do it. He's like, you know, like we we never know when we're going to do volume two. And I was like, yeah, what? Well, it like leaves people hanging. He's like, I know, and that drives me nuts. And uh, uh, I was like, you know, well, Van Halen did it with like a best of volume one. He's like, I know, and they never came out with volume two. And he's like, and it drove me nuts. I was like, I know, I was just, you know, like, but we don't have to be like Van Halen. It's like we just want to be cool like Van Halen. Um, so um, today. Uh, we're hitting um, we're hitting a parable uh, that I think is going to bring us to something I think is pretty important for us the church uh, today. I, I hope so. I hope that I hope that it's as meaningful you for you as that it is for me. Um, and um, um, I'm, I've been praying about it. Been praying about. Uh, where it leads us by the end of the service even. And so uh, if you've got a Bible and you want to get it out, we're going to Luke 18 today, Luke chapter 18. Um, And uh, if you don't have a Bible or ushers have Bibles, they'll bring you one, just throw your hand up. Uh, I'll be glad to get you one. But uh, Luke chapter 18, verse 9 is where we're going today. Um, And this is a parable about a Pharisee and a tax collector. And um, you know, the if, if, first of all, if you're just joining in with us uh, on this series, you know, Jesus makes clear, uh, you know, at a point when the disciples ask him, Jesus, why do you teach through parables? And he says, I'm, I'm using these stories to basically explain the kingdom of God. And I want, I want you guys to understand, you know, more things about the kingdom of God and, and, a lot of times he's doing that kind of undercover, and then sometimes he's doing that where he's just kind of like playing out in the open. Uh, this is one of those more playing out in the open um, kind of things, um, and uh, this one in particular that we're studying on today. And um, you know, the target audiences here were you know obviously listeners, but the listeners were different types of folks. We had you had folks that were believers, folks that weren't believers, folks that were uh, head hunting Jesus, literally trying to kill him. That, that was the case with uh, what you saw with a lot of the Pharisees, a um, lot of uh, you know the, the religious zealots, if you will, the scribes of the day, um, and. Um, you know, and, and the reason being, by the way, is because it wasn't because you know all religious people were bad. Uh, it was because they had they thought they had it figured out. You know, and and you know when you think you've got something figured out, we don't like being wrong, right? And and they didn't want to be wrong, and they thought they had it figured out. And they, they were not pegging Jesus as the Messiah. They were looking for the Messiah, but they weren't pegging Jesus as being the Messiah. They were looking for somebody else. They were looking, they were looking for what a lot of people are looking for on Tuesday night, okay? They were looking for this political figure that was going to save their bank accounts, you know, and all of these other things that people are hopeful for in, you know, this political type leader type person, a king. They're looking for a king. They're looking for for that type of a person, um, and so. Uh, but that's not that's not what God intended. God God was sending a Messiah to be this person that was going to save the world, not bank accounts. Okay, and and so you know to to save people from their sin, right? And and so Jesus comes, and not the way <laughs> that that they were looking, right? Humble, the humble king, right? Which is very fitting for this message today. Um, and Jesus comes and God sends him, his only son, uh, to be the perfect sacrifice, to die the death that we deserve and to live the life that we couldn't live, one without sin, 
to take a place on a cross that we but we couldn't have died you know the, the scriptures you know teach us the, the basic of the gospel is that our sin there's a penalty for sin that our sin deserves death okay and and that sin had to be paid for somehow and that jesus basically ends up being the one to pay that penalty on our behalf okay he stands before the judge and says i'll pay their i'll pay their debt and if we believe and trust in him that we shall be saved this is a beautiful thing and we didn't do anything to deserve it and all we can do to get it is literally receive it it's a gift it's like christmas it's like here you go all we can do is take it all we get all we can do is believe trust him right so we come to this passage in luke 18 and jesus is telling uh, the listeners, and we don't exactly know who the crowd is, but we, we think it's probably Pharisees, maybe Pharisees and the disciples together. We're not positive, doesn't really say. But we have this story. And, and again, uh, as I mentioned in, in with some of the other parables, these are oftentimes probably made-up parables. They don't have to be necessarily true stories. Jesus isn't saying, fact-check me, I'm telling you something that actually happened. He's telling a story to drive home a point, okay? And so he's telling a story about two men, and I want us to go ahead and read that. In Luke 18, verse 9, it says this. It says, he also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Can we pray over that? Let's pray over it. God, we come to you today and we ask, Lord, that you would speak in a mighty way through your word. And I pray, Lord, that you would do so in a way in your church today, God, that you would use it, uh, Lord, in a healing way. God, I pray, Lord, that you would do so today in a way, Lord, that would move in our hearts, in our minds. Lord, help us. Help us in our hearts, Lord, as we look toward others. Help us as we see others, as we may hold things against others. Lord, help us to not do that. God, help us to see with the eyes of Jesus. Lord, help us to love with the hearts of Jesus. God, thank you for sending your Son for us. God, I pray, Lord, that you would just help us today to hear, Lord, from you through your word. God, we ask this today in your Son's name. Amen. So, this parable, two men, it starts off here. As he told the parable, it says, to some who trusted in, in themselves that they were righteous, that pretty much tells you right off the bat, we're probably talking about Pharisees, and treated others with contempt. He says, verse 10, two men went up into the temple to pray one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The temple in Jerusalem was up on a hill, so you know, no matter you know who's going up there, you're going up the hill, right? And so it's kind of you know, Jack and Jill went up the hill, but it's two guys, okay? So two men go up, go up, go up the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and one a tax collector. It sounds like a joke, but they're not going into a bar, right? <clears throat> and there's no and there's no priest yet, right? One's a Pharisee, so he's close, but whatever. And so then in verse 11, uh, then we've got, it says this, it says, the Pharisee standing by himself, and this is really important, there's a lot of detail here given to these things. It says, the Pharisee standing by himself prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. This is a, this is a pretty... It's a pretty bold statement to God, I feel like. You know, uh, it's, uh, it's definitely telling you his heart, you know. And, and I, think it's, I think it's easy for us to look at this and go, man, 
you know, the, the gall of this guy, you know, he's, you know, wow. You know, he's, he's, he's naming off, you know, uh, thank you that I'm not like these other men, extortioners, unjust adulterers, or even like this tax collector. He's, you know, he's, he's telling God, thank, thank you that I'm not like this guy standing, uh, in the room with me. Right. And then he goes on in verse, in verse 12, it says, I fast, this is still the tax, this is still, I'm sorry, the Pharisee, in his prayer, okay, to God, he says, I fast twice a week, I give tithes of all that I get. And then in verse 13, it shifts gears here, and it's the tax collector. says, But the tax collector, standing far off, also in the temple, says, would not even lift his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And then Jesus says, I tell you, this man went to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. This is a, this is quite a picture that Jesus is painting. Quite a picture that Jesus is painting. The outward appearance uh, is one that looks to be without fault, right? You've got you've got one one of these guys, Pharisee. He he you know he's the religious guy. You know he looks to be without fault, and then you've got one that looks like someone who you would assume to be a terrible person. Let, let's talk about the tax collector thing for just a minute, okay? Um, and without picking on any of our IRS uh, employees that are here, um, you know. I, a little different, a little different back in the day with tax collectors. Just to be honest with you, tax collectors back then uh, were were seen as as folks that were honestly uh, just, uh, I mean, just flat out, uh, you know, people who are just just terrible people, terrible people. They they truly they truly were considered extortionists, right? They they were considered to be people who had turned on their people. You know, people. You know, they would they would go after the. You know, they were, first of all they're working for the Roman government who had come in and taken over. So it had gone in and found people. Oftentimes, uh, you know, that might have known the people, and then you know, with the lure of money, you know, talked them into you know, with their knowledge of the people, basically turning on their their friends and family right, with that knowledge to extort money from them. Like, oh, I know, I know you've got this side gig over here. I know you're doing that over there. I know, I know you're teaching piano over here. You know, just all these, any, any little thing I know, I know you've been making those pies. You know, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to get some of that. You know I mean? Just, just any, any, you know, oh, I know you've been cutting your neighbor's grass. We're going to need some of that. I mean, just any little thing that they could do. And I mean, just considered traitors, really. I mean, just considered awful people. And and not only that, but oftentimes a lot of these tax collectors they had they had such great power that they took liberties to oftentimes take extra for themselves. If you know what I mean, this is you know a little bit of little bit of mafia mentality here, right? So. That's, that's the kind of people that we're working with here. And so this is the picture of the person that Jesus has picked to use in this story on purpose, right? Uh, you know, in fact, I think about when, I, when, I'm, when I'm reading this, I'm thinking about like, uh, I couldn't help but think about like the, the mob movies that you've seen. Like, it seems like most mob movies, there's like, there's, you get like three quarter of the way into the movie and there's always like a scene where like right before there's going to be some huge fight some huge blowout that like you know the mob boss like goes to the church right you know and he lights a candle and he says a prayer he meets with the priest he goes in the little thing you know whatever you know and and there's people and the people that are in there that see him are like oh what's what's he doing in here like oh man we got we better get out of here we may get shot while we're in here you know kind of thing right that's the picture that Jesus is painting. Like, what's this guy doing here? 
truth is, I think there's probably people that feel that way. I know there's people that feel that way when they come to church in real life. You ever think about that? Maybe you've been one of those people. Maybe you are one of those people. Maybe you're, maybe you're sitting here today. Maybe you're like, oh, that's me. That's me. I feel that way right now. It was everything I could do to show up today. Maybe you're watching online right now and you feel that way. You're like, oh, I'm thinking somebody's probably staring at me, like looking at me like they can see I'm watching online right now. And they're like, what is it? What are they doing watching online? You know, kind of like, look, doesn't matter. Jesus loves you. We love you. The truth is, just being associated with 24 these days probably gets you looked at that way. The tax collector would have been someone who had betrayed everyone. Imagine being that guy walking into a church. And walking into a church is tough enough sometimes for a lot of people. Walking into a church is tough enough for a lot of people. And, and that goes for all sorts of reasons and all sorts of hurt and all sorts of things that have happened in the past. And it can be, and it can be also because of just being new or maybe it's just a hard moment in life or you're just feeling rough. Just all sorts of reasons can make it tough. Then you got this Pharisee. And here's a guy who looks like someone who should be there but then his attitude is one of like, I'm doubling down on my fasting and my tithing. Look at me. I'm trying to find extra favor for future sin, extra love from God. Look at my, look at my tithes, God. Look at, look at, look at my, look at my fasting, God. That's, that's what, in a sense, that's what he's doing. And honestly, that wasn't uncommon for pious religious folks to do things like that it went, and it and it really was like this attempt to like feel like i'm going to get ahead right i'm going to get ahead of my sin so then that way friday night when things are kicking and i'm feeling a little extra well i you know we did a little extra fasting this week baby it's okay you know God, how exhausting that must be. This works-based salvation? Completely unbiblical. Completely untrue. Totally a false gospel. Totally, of course, again, at, at that point in time, they weren't believing in Jesus to be the Messiah, so it, they didn't have a gospel-based salvation. But you've got this guy's basically Jesus is, and, and this is Jesus painting the picture. So I, I don't want to go too far with it, but at the same time, I want to take what Jesus is giving us, and He's painting the picture, and He's painting this picture of someone that's saying, "Look at me, look at me, Lord, look at what I've done for you." His entire prayer is, "Look at me, Lord, look at what I've done for you," right? Versus you've got the other guy who's you know, completely like relying on God's mercy, contrary to the self-confident one who's saying, you know, I got, I got all this done for you. And you've got a tax collector who's basically saying, God, I need you every step of the way. I am at your mercy. Let's be clear about something here. What Jesus is not doing through this is he's not calling us to better morality, okay? He's not giving us a list of behaviors to stay away from or to run to. He's calling us to humility. He's calling us to humility. If we can do this, the rest takes care of itself. We'll find ourselves at the feet of Jesus. We'll find ourselves resting in his mercy. We'll find ourselves running from our sin 
Did you hear that? Running from our sin. Not running to it, running from it. Because if we're at the feet of Jesus, we're running from our sin. I promise you. We've been in this study, men's study. We've got the last one, technically. We may have another one here in a couple of weeks. We've been, we're talking about that. We're going to kick that down the road Tuesday night and talk about it for a minute Tuesday night. We've got one more at least Tuesday night at the shop. Uh, been averaging 50, 60 men at the shop. It's great. Uh, we've been talking about overcoming temptation, different guys teaching every week. They've done a fantastic job. Uh, this week, we're actually talking about what happens when you fall. What do you do when you fall? Because it is going to happen. What do you do with that? Um, been a fantastic study. Um, as we've been talking through that, one of the things that's been great is these last couple of weeks, especially, we've been, we've been actually given some time to confessing sin and like setting at the tables and being able to share like actual like, here's the struggles, let's pray for each other, you know? And man, I, I got to tell you, it's been so powerful to get to see men that hardly know each other sharing things and praying for one another about things, struggles going on in their lives, and then, and then some stories, and I've gotten to share one of these stories with a couple of tables that I think has shocked a couple of tables, and that's, that's a good thing, um, over the victory that I've had in some sin in my, my personal life that I'm so thankful for. That, I, you know, that at the bottom, at the end of the day, one of the things that I've been able to share is that once you've had victory over sin for so long, a sin that you, want, you once thought would have victory over you in life forever, what, a, a sin that you thought you would never get rid of in your life, that you get to this place with it, that when it comes up, when you start to think about it, that it actually makes you sick at your stomach to even think about going back to that. That's victory. That's healing from the Lord. And it is this reminder for us that God truly wants to heal us from these things. And he has freed us from these things through the blood of the cross. The chains are broken. We've been set free. We're the ones holding on to these things. I, I've actually, when I was sharing... <laughs> <laughs> with these guys the other night i actually picked up this chair and like put it on my back when i got to that part of talking about it. i was like we're the ones like picking this thing up and like carrying it everywhere we go it's like it's not attached to us we're carrying it with us and it's hurting us we will run from sin if we are at the feet of jesus i'm going to say it again we will run from sin if we are at the feet of Jesus. Okay? In our hearts, in our hearts, here's, here's the trouble, in our hearts, it's easy for us to say, how dare they act like that and think God is okay with them? You know, while in our hearts, we are in sin against them. Talking about, talking about, you know, looking at, you know, Pharisee, looking at the tax collector, you know. The Pharisee looked at the tax collector. He thought he was trash. He thought he was trash. And it's easy for us on this side of this to look at this story and go, man, I can't believe that Pharisee just thought that guy was just trash. But we think people are trash sometimes. If we're being honest with ourselves, sometimes we think people are trash. We're not supposed to think that. We can't think like that. He is self-righteous. He thinks he has it together. And he looks down on the other guy. And these things often go together. Which equals folks that are quick to judge others, right? Right? And we're all in the boat of like, we don't want to be people that judge others, right? And we'd like to think that we would never do that. What if someone came to church and it's someone that has sinned against you, someone that's hurt you, 
Maybe it's a person who stands for things that you don't. They don't believe like you do. What if it's someone that hurts you? These are valid questions, right? Things worth asking. In reference to the Pharisee, Plummer mentions that he glances at God and contemplates himself. He glances at God and contemplates himself. I think sometimes that's us. Like we see that picture. Maybe, maybe when we maybe when we worship, maybe when we spend time in prayer to God, maybe we're not saying things like, God, thank you for not making me like that guy. Okay? Maybe we're not that bold with the prayer. But if we're being honest, maybe sometimes we're glancing at God and we're really contemplating just ourselves. When's the last time that you spent time with the Lord and it was all about the Lord? When was the last time that you spent time with the Lord and it was all about how good he is? How great he is? How amazing he is? How gracious he is? How merciful he is? Right? How good he is? How consistent he is, how faithful he is, how loving he is. How many times have we done that and we just don't even realize it? We're so about us that we don't even realize that we're not even about him. A lot of times when we're given the chance for it to be about him. He can't bring himself, the the tax collector, going to the tax collector, he can't bring himself to even look to heaven. He feels so bad over his sin, so broken. He feels unworthy. So much so, he's beating his chest in anguish. Leon Morris mentions, even as he looks for forgiveness, he recognizes what he deserves. Even as he looks for forgiveness, he recognizes what he deserves. He's begging for mercy. And he has no trophies to show God, right? He has no trophies to show God. The other guy, what's he doing? He's like, here's my tithes. Here's my fasting. Which, by the way, we're way above like the amounts required in the law and all this. And I didn't want to get into all that today, but, you know, he's an overachiever faster and tither. I'll just put it that way. The tax collector is at the feet of the judge saying, here's my sin. I'm at your mercy, O God. And he's the one that at the end is justified He's the one that's acquitted. He's the one that's cleared. That's what I call justified humility. And we need that. We need justified humility. You want to know why? I got a couple of verses for you. Luke 14, 11. If you go back earlier in the book of Luke, Luke 14, 11 says this. It says, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. By the way, there are so many verses in Scripture 
that are based around that's this similar saying, so many. James 4, 6 also says this. It says, but he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. We need humility. We desperately need humility. So Jesus is saying, the one that humbles himself before the Lord will be cleared, will be saved, will be justified, will be acquitted of all the charges, forgiven of all the sin. But we can't, we can't do that on our own. We know from other scriptures we can't do that. So who can? Jesus. Ephesians 2, verse 8 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. I hope you know this truth. I hope you have received this grace. If not, today, today is your day. Today is your day to trust in Jesus, to believe. If you feel God speaking to your heart, let today be that day. Let today be the day that you're justified, that you're acquitted, that you're cleared of all sin, no matter what it is, no matter where you've been, no matter what you've done. God wants to do that for you. But there's one more thing. There's one more thing about this passage. Something happens in this passage. There's a, there's a, there's a thing in this passage that's, that's happening that I think is important, that I think we could miss. And this is where it's important. I think uh, this is where I, I really enjoy teaching expository. We're not really doing that through the series because we're teaching these individual parables. But when you go back and you look at Luke and you look at, the, you look at the parable before it, you have another parable before it. And then this other parable, if you take that parable in with this parable, we're not going to read that whole parable, but I want to tell you a little bit about it. You've got another story that Jesus tells, and it's about a lady. And it's about a lady who goes to this judge, and she keeps going to this judge over and over, and he's a guy who is, it, it, Jesus, as Jesus tells it, who is not a God-fearing man. In other words, he's not... He's not with the program, okay? He's not somebody who is trying to follow the Lord or anything like that. Uh, but this lady keeps going to this judge over and over, pleading her case. And basically, the judge, over time, finally hears what she's saying and finally sees it her way and, and rules in, in her way just to get her off his back, okay? And then Jesus has something to say about that, and this that happens in Luke 18, 6, and I want to read this little part of it to you. This happens just right before the section that we just read. Luke 18, 6, and it says this, it says, and the Lord said, hear what the unrighteous judge says, and will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? Jesus is talking about us praying. Jesus is talking about us praying. And then he tells a parable about two men who go to a temple and pray. Right? There's a theme there. And I look at that theme and I go, okay, Jesus is teaching us a couple of things here. And I think there's a second thing, and I think the second thing is the importance that we shouldn't miss this thing about prayer. Prayer is like water. Water and I have a funny relationship. Um... The reason I say that is because there have been times in my life where I'm pretty sure that I kept the company Mountain Dew alive. 
Um, and then there's other times where I kicked soda and drank only water, you know, for a year at a time, whatever. And uh, in more recent days, I've done that again. Uh, funny enough, and this is a good thing, obviously, um, funny enough, I've been trying to be better about some things health-wise. And, and one of the things that's happened is I've pretty much uh, all but quit sodas. I'll have something every once in a while. Uh, there are certain meals. I, I know I've had, I've had this conversation with a lot of people. There are certain meals that I, I really want to have a soda with. It's like I've had those. I, I'm I'm so guilty of like going to restaurants, eating the same thing at every restaurant that I eat at. Like I, you know, there are certain restaurants. If you ever go there with me, we will sit down. I will not have to order. Okay, they already know what I'm supposed to get. Okay, and they. I mean, it just it works out that way. Um, I'm grateful. Um, and so, um, but anyway, and, and with certain meals, you know, be it Thai food, Mexican, hot chicken, whatever, uh, there are sodas that I enjoy, you know, having with these meals, whatever. Um, and so, uh, but I've noticed here lately that when I'm having these sodas, I, I keep, I keep, I keep trying them. I keep going, I think something's wrong with your machine. Well, this happened the other day, and it was a it was a bottled, you know, thing I'm pouring over ice, and I'm going, this tastes like the bad machine soda I've been having here lately, and it's just getting to where I actually kind of don't like it anymore. I guess I'm, I'm thankful. I'm actually really thankful. I want this now more than I want the others. It's a good thing. Good thing to happen. The truth is, we all know this. We're supposed to have X amount of this every day of our life, right? It's, it's a good thing for us. God created us needing this every day of our life. He also created us needing him, folks. He also created, created us needing time with him, us being with him in prayer, we were not created to be supermen who just fly around doing it on our own. You may say, Chris, I, I struggle with prayer. Well, how about this? What if every time you take a drink this week, you pray? What if you start with that? You say, well, Chris, that might be a little weird. It could be if you close your eyes every time. I mean, that's up to you, um, especially if you're driving. <laughs> Maybe don't do that. Um, it's just a thought. I, you know, I'm not trying to get legalistic about it. I'm just trying to be helpful. Like, find something that works, you know? Like, we need the Lord. But, I mean, it, here's, here's another question. When was the last time that you just went to the Lord about something and just got on your knees. Did you see the two guys who went up the hill to the temple? Did you see what they did? One guy stood there, and he stood here like this. It's like, here you go, God. Here's what I've done. Look at me, right? What the other guy do? He's on his knees. He's at the feet of Jesus. He's laying it all out. He's saying, God, I am at your mercy. Maybe things are going great for you right now. Maybe everything's perfect. Boy, congratulations to you. God, you got time this week? I want to hang out with you. Um, if that is the case... Maybe, just maybe, you could go to the feet of Jesus on someone else's behalf. Maybe things aren't perfect for you, and you could still go to the feet of Jesus on somebody else's behalf. How about that? When was the last time that you went before the Lord and really got down and took him something? How about right now? What if I gave us time right 
now to do that. I'm not talking about getting rushed into a song. I'm talking about right now. We take some time to pray. In just a minute, we're going to have a time of prayer. We're not going to rush it. And I'm going to invite you to do whatever you feel comfortable doing. And it's not for show, but if you feel like it'd help you to kneel at this altar, to kneel at your chair, to go outside, kneel in the grass, to lay down in the back of your pickup truck, I don't care. Whatever you feel like would help you get to the feet of Jesus the fastest, I want to encourage you to do that. If you feel like you need to grab a friend and pray with them right now, I don't care. I really don't. If you need to pray for someone else, pray for someone else. If you need to beg God to heal you of a sin like I was talking about a little while ago, then you do that. He can do it. And he will, if you'll let him. Justified humility. Do you have it? If you want to talk about knowing Jesus as your Savior, I'm going to go to the foyer right now. I would love to talk to you about what it means to know Jesus as your Savior. These guys know that we're not rushing this time. We're going to take as long as we need. If we take 10 minutes, 15 minutes, I don't care. We got another service coming in. They'll wait, whatever. They'll be out there in the parking lot going, well, what's going on in there? It'll be okay. We're going to be sensitive to the Lord here. We want you to have some time to meet with the Lord. Let's pray right now. I'm going to begin us with a prayer. You get comfortable. You pray however you need to pray. They're going to begin to play some music, but this is your time to pray. This is your time to get to the feet of Jesus. Whatever that looks like for you, you do it. God, I lift up this church, this church body. God, I lift up the people that make up this body. I lift up their families. God, you know the struggles. You know the victories. God, your hand be with them, on them, guide them with grace and great mercy. and healing Lord we lift up the hope center to you today we lift up the work that you're doing there we lift up our community our counties God, we pray that you would change people's hearts to follow you. God, that they would know your grace, that they would know your love, because they know us. More importantly, because they might know you. But God, if you can use us, use us. God, I pray right now for our nation. We can't fix it. We don't even know if it can be fixed, Lord. But we ask that you would use us as instruments of your grace and your mercy and your love in the midst of whatever is in front of us in all the things
God, I lift up our folks to you right now, Lord, as they're bringing whatever it is to your feet. God, I pray, Lord, that you would take it. I pray, Lord, that you would heal it. God, I pray for any, Lord, that have never trusted in you to know you as their Savior. God, I pray that today would be their day to call victory over their sin. To be healed by the blood of Jesus. God, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. God, have mercy on us. Be glorified in us. We ask this in Jesus' name.